One possible application is the preservation of fruit and vegetable crops on off-grid farms, no energy necessary. The researchers calculated that cooling food containers with icer could extend shelf life of produce by about 40% in humid areas and over 200% in drier ones, especially in regions where traditional cooling systems are restricted by a lack of water. All right, I want to look at uh, cooling your home and cooling your food without increasing your electricity bill or basically without a bill at all. Uh, there's some new technology that's being developed that basically uses a type of gel to cool your house and cool your home with no use in uh, electricity, which sounds cool. Um, I'm going to go over this video and kind of give my opinion on it and uh, let's see what they have to say. To regulate the temperature of food, medicine, or people, we'll always need some form of cooling tech to survive. We tend to turn on air conditioning to solve these problems, but that's stuck us in a positive feedback loop that isn't all that positive. Hot days are becoming hotter, and the demand for cooling is surging. So how do we break the cycle? Well, a team of researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have an idea. Stack the same cooling techniques we've been using for thousands of years by harnessing the power of aerogel. No power, no emissions, no problem? <laughs> I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. Before we get into MIT's aerogel proposal, it's important to discuss why curbing our AC addiction is necessary. It's because the way things are going, we probably shouldn't be keeping our cool about how we keep ourselves cool. According to the Clean Cooling Collaborative, 20% of the world's electricity is spent powering air conditioning and electric fans. And as temperatures intensify, usage is increasing. At this rate, the global number of AC units is projected to triple by 2050. The International Energy Agency reports that last year in particular saw cooling demand account for about 16% of all energy used in buildings worldwide for about 2,000 terawatt hours. They say worldwide. I wonder is that um, maybe buildings with or countries that have a lot of cities with tall buildings and condos because there's recently been a ton of condo development. And so with that development, I would think that the demand goes up unless... Unless, you know, it's, well, it still could go up maybe because they populate maybe half of those condos because you hear about the cities like New York or even uh, over in uh, Canada, Toronto, where condos are being built, but no one's living in them. Uh, regardless of that, they're, they're ones that people are moving into. I wonder if, if that has something to do too with it, with all the development going on in uh, the industrialized or post-industrialized countries. Just something I was thinking about. Now, the problem isn't just a matter of energy use either. Air conditioning is a major contributor to CO2 emissions. The indirect CO2 emissions from cooling buildings more than doubled between 1990 and 2021 to about one gigaton. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, AC also releases hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants, or HFCs, which pollute the atmosphere even more. And they're thousands of times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. Now that said, air conditioning isn't our only option. People have been using natural methods of staying comfortable indoors for thousands of years. We can see them in historic buildings all over the world, from the wind catcher towers in the Middle East and North Africa to courtyards in China and Spain. And this it seems like the ancient technologies that they keep discovering, uh, it, it, it wasn't as if the cultures back then were not advanced. Maybe they just had different methods and some of them seem to still use those today. I think we could learn a lot from that. And based on this, it seems like that's happening right now sleeping porches in the American South. These structures aren't just for show. They're examples of passive cooling, architectural elements that control both the loss and gain of heat. So managing a building's temperature without consuming electricity or producing carbon emissions is nothing new. But when it comes to modern alternatives to air conditioning, the passive cooling system presented by MIT researchers in September is unique for its three-pronged approach. The design combines insulated cooling with evaporation and radiation into one convenient package called ICER. It sounds a bit like a frozen drink maker, but it's more like a solar panel that uses the sun's rays to produce cooling rather than energy. So let's break. Now that sounds like a great idea. You're basically using solar energy, uh, again, to produce cooling. Whereas, uh, it kind of reminds me of um, some how some ACs use the heat. Basically, they suck the, the air out to produce cooling. I wonder if it's a similar concept. I don't know, I could be off here, but I was just wondering down what all this means. To start, it's important to remember that heat is our literal fair weather friend. 
It leaves when we need it in the winter and intrudes when we want to avoid it in the middle of the summer. The good news, even though we can't change the ways of an unreliable person, we can get around the way heat behaves with the power of thermodynamics. Here's how ICER does that. First, the IC is for insulated coolant. Thermodynamics, people, for you uh, mechanical engineers out there, and maybe some of you electrical, uh, it's, I don't know if everyone was required to take that class, uh, but uh, some engineers would know what I'm talking about. Now, generally speaking, insulation slows down the flow of heat from warmer areas to colder ones. As for E, evaporative cooling is the process of water lowering the temperature of a surface when it absorbs enough heat to change from liquid to gas, which we experience whenever we sweat. And lastly, R, which is radiative cooling, is the loss of heat through thermal radiation, like when the Earth radiates heat out into space. Now, this is what causes the chill that we feel on cloudless nights, and it's also how people of Iran and India managed to make ice long before we could pop a tray into the freezer. Now, in the context of reducing our reliance upon air conditioning, there's promising developments on the use of radiative sky cooling to effectively shoot heat into space. I talked about how radiative cooling is being implemented in a previous video. It's pretty cool. The MIT researchers behind ICER, though, do note that high-performance radiative cooling is typically limited to specific climate conditions. So now that we know the principles ICER operates on, how does it work? Well, one important aspect to that is what NASA calls one of the finest insulation materials available. And while it's not the finest insulation material available, it's still a pretty incredible piece of tech that you can get for your home, and it comes from today's sponsor, 8sleep. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone when I say that I struggle to get a good night's sleep every night. I either get overheated in the middle of the night. Let me fast forward this plug here. <laughs> That's a nice uh, segue he's got there. Stages. It's the first sleep tracking system that I've ever used that actively in how I'm sleeping Going. each night. Eight from the link in the description to get one today into a dehydrator, assuming <laughs> you like work. You can think of it like an open face sandwich. On the top layer is aerogel. Aerogel is basically what you get when you put a gelatin mold into a dehydrator, <laughs> assuming you like the taste of plastic. And normally doing just that would reduce the dessert to the powder that you started with. But the magic of aerogel is that it retains its shape even after its initial gel form loses all its moisture. The result is a solid but extremely late chunk of what NASA calls one of the finest insulation materials available. It's really kind of trippy stuff. Now this is because aerogel is like a sponge, but with pores too tiny for the human eye to see. They make up 95% of aerogel's volume, giving it a very low density. Now these pores are smaller than human hair, about the same size as air molecules. Now air has low thermal conductivity, meaning that it's difficult for heat to pass through it. So as a result of these factors, air doesn't have much space to flow freely through aerogel, making it very effective in thermal insulation. Effective enough to use while exploring the cold void of space. Now, speaking of space, infrared radiation passes right through aerogel. That's why ICER's top layer can both insulate and allow for radiative cooling. Hydrogel is the next layer of the ICER sandwich. As the name implies, it's the wet sponge to aerogel's dry sponge full of water instead of air. This water is the singular resource that ICER consumes. As it evaporates over time, it rises past the aerogel and out into the open, taking heat with it. When the hydrogel eventually dries out, recharging ICER is simple. All it needs is someone to just add water. And the researchers estimate that the setup can continue to function unattended for about 10 days in most. This makes me wonder, there are those little, um, you know those little micro air conditioners you can order online? And some of them, they say you just add water. I wonder if it's the same concept. I'm not sure, I haven't ordered one, but it gives me an idea uh, to order one for maybe a small room. Just something to ponder. Cases, or even over a month on the US's west coast. In hot arid regions like Las Vegas and Phoenix, a single charge cycle can last about four days. Now beneath the hydrogel lies ICER's third and final layer, which is the mirror-like base. It reflects sunlight back through the layers above it, preventing the device's materials from heating up. ICER's aerogel is highly reflective too, providing even more resistance against the sun's heat. So far, ICER has only been tested on a small, 10 centimeter wide scale on top of an MIT building's roof. However, the results were significant. The researchers reported that even under poor weather conditions, ICER's capabilities represented a 300% improvement upon a radiative cooler. This amounted to ICER reaching 9.3 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature under direct sunlight. Now, beyond its potential as a stand- That's not bad for under direct sunlight. So imagine if there was shade or a roof under it. It'd be a lot cooler and a lot less noise, I would think. Uh, but you know what? Some of us like that AC noise. It kind of puts us to sleep. Standalone cooling system, ICER could also be used in retrofitting existing air conditioners to improve their efficiency. 
It's inventors. That's a good point too to kind of um, insert it into AC or uh, upgrade the AC with the different technology. I wonder if it'd make it more quiet. Not that uh, I care about that. I mean, some people would though, maybe. Reference a 2017 Stanford University study that used radiative cooling panels to lower the temperature of running water. Using a simulation, Stanford researchers estimated that these panels could reduce the electricity consumption of an office building's AC system by 21%. The MIT team predicts that ICER could save even more energy when integrated in a similar way. This means that ICER might not necessarily need to replace an air conditioner, allowing us to work with what we've got, meaning this could be an additive solution instead of a replacement. ICER could also make- I think for some people, depending on the cost, because that's gonna be another issue. I hate to talk about cost, but we know uh, a lot of times people do do things for profit, so, are you going to be gouged with this type of device or not? And for some people, if it is cheaper than AC and it doesn't use electricity, this may be a great alternative. Or, or is it going to be purposefully, pur purposefully designed where it doesn't cool enough uh, for the heat, but only designed for an additive solution just to keep the power bill at a certain level? I don't know. I don't know, but you know, I, I guess it's some. That's my pessimist side. It's not really big. My pessimist side is not really big, but sometimes you just wonder. You always get your hopes up with these things, and then somebody throws a monkey wrench in the whole uh, fairy tale. It's kind of like with electric vehicles, right? You you're thinking, okay, yeah, we're gonna just charge the vehicle, and then you go to a charging station, and I see they charge like twenty dollars for thirty minutes, like things like that kind of discourages you. So I don't know if that's the case here. I hope not. Uh, it sounds promising. Make a big impact on the way that we store food. One possible application is the preservation of fruit and vegetable crops on off-grid farms. No energy necessary. The researchers... Now that's a great, great, great use for it. Excellent use. Calculated that cooling food containers with ICER could extend shelf life of produce by about 40% in humid areas and over 200% in drier ones especially in regions where traditional cooling systems are restricted by a lack of water or energy. ICER could theoretically prolong the shelf life of food when it would otherwise spoil. It would be like having a cooler that cools itself. But don't- th I wonder how meat would work. <laughs> That's a whole different ball game. Throw out your ice packs just- Or ice cream. Yeah, he's going, he's saying don't throw out your ice packs just yet. Let's see what he has to say with that. Yet, because manufacturing polyethylene aerogel or PEA is unfortunately more complicated than sticking wobbly jelly into a dryer. It's a delicate operation that requires slowly removing solvents without compromising the structure of the gel. This is accomplished through critical point drying, or CPD, which uses expensive special equipment. As the researchers note, the CPD process is not scalable. Long story short, producing aerogel that the ICER depends on, it's not cheap, but there's still room for optimism. I mean, it's what most- Of course. <laughs> I'm laughing and he said it's still room for optimism. <laughs> he must have, uh read my mind with the pessimism. Motivates me to make the videos on my channel. <laughs> ICER's aerogel component is the only one that isn't freely available right now, but that might change as aerogel becomes more popular as a material for tech like supercapacitors and batteries. And then I can see how this could be used for uh, electronic devices or even in a car just to cool things down. It may also help with overheating in a car or just overheating in a factory or things like that. I think there's a lot of good applications for this. Meantime, the MIT team is what I mean is uh, applications, not just AC, but other applications as far as just a cooling tool that saves money that doesn't require um, electricity. Seeking out a viable way to cut down the costs. This could look like using freeze drying rather than CPD during production or swapping the PEA with a different kind of insulation altogether. In fact, we already know this is feasible. Researchers from Nanjing Forestry University in China and University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Germany have also designed an aerogel-based passive cooler that blends radiative cooling and thermal insulation. Like ICER, it reflects sunlight, releases absorbed heat, and provides thermal insulation without any electricity. The difference is that their aerogel is composed of cellulose nanocrystals and just so happens to be made using freeze drying in a process that can be scaled up. So how does cellulose- Now, there we go, that's promising. I, it looks like the Chinese have come up with a way to make it be scalable. Cellulose nanocrystal aerogel or CNC compared with PEA. Well, hopefully all this talk about jelly and sandwiches hasn't got you hungry. 
because it has for me, because it's getting very close to lunch. Because here's another food analogy. Marshmallows are a lot like aerogel. They're made of a gelatin and they're full of air. When marshmallows are cooked in a microwave, they inflate. PA poofs up in a similar way as it's made. In both cases, you end up with a big, fluffy solid full of trapped air, but you can't do much to change its shape. CNC is another story. It's more like a soft serve ice cream cone, which you can carefully turn to form its iconic twisted look. When producing CNC, scientists have a similar level of control over its structure as they direct the bonding of the compounds that make it up. I like how he's comparing all these things to food, but uh, I'm sure you can't eat any of this and it's not edible. It'll probably do a lot of damage or kill you. Like other types of aerogel, CNC has low thermal conductivity. However, gel-based networks of chemicals tend to be a little more brittle, and cellulose nanocrystals are more robust. The CNC created for this particular study is also white and highly reflective. It also doesn't hurt that cellulose is the most abundant biopolymer on Earth. But did the cellulose aerogel perform as well? Well, it turns out the results published by the joint research team in May are very similar to ICER's. To refresh your memory, ICER's cooling was powerful enough to reach 9.3 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature under direct sunlight. The CNC-based cooler managed a drop of 9.2 degrees Celsius under direct sunlight, and roughly 7.4 degrees in what researchers call hot, moist, and fickle weather. I love the fact they use the word fickle. And using modeling, the researchers estimated that their CNC cooler could reduce energy consumption in China-based buildings by about 35%. Aerogel is clearly a valuable resource in the realm of thermal insulation, but how does it compare against existing insulation materials in the real world? In a study published in September, a group of researchers from universities in China and Australia put their own formula to the test. Called anisotropic cooling aerogel, or ACA, it's produced with freeze drying like CNC. What makes ACA's development different though is that it's inspired by 3D printing. The researchers built their aerogel panels block by block the same way a 3D printer builds an object in layers. This provides them with enough precision to keep the dimensions of the gel's pores aligned and consistent in their dimensions. That's another great application for 3D printing. I, I've made a video regarding 3D printing and printing houses, but this is also a great application. This is really getting becoming like uh, the future is right around the corner. It's almost like we'll be 3D printing everything. As for what anisotropic means and why it matters, most materials are either isotropic or anisotropic. If something is isotropic, its properties are even and identical throughout, regardless of the direction that you measure it. So it's nice and predictable like bulk glass and metals. Otherwise, a material is anisotropic, meaning that its properties aren't even or identical. Wood is a classic example. It's stronger along its lines or grain than against it. According to the researchers, anisotropic aerogels with highly lined pores act as a better insulator than isotropic ones. So it's worth finding ways to produce them. And the ACA did deliver. When the team placed the gel on a hot plate heated to 90 degrees Celsius, its top surface eventually remained steady at a temperature of about 41 degrees Celsius. By comparison to existing insulation. Wow, that's like half the temperature it was heated up to. Products. Actually, it's, yeah, close to half. At least it's close to half anyway. EPS foam and silica aerogel became six and 10 degrees Celsius hotter than the ACA respectively. In another series of tests, the researchers measured the ACA's thermal insulation capacity on a hot and humid day in Hong Kong. Under direct sunlight, the ACA panel maintained a lower interior temperature than four other insulation materials, brick, glass, EPS foam, and silica aerogel. Now, the ACA also demonstrated passive cooling with a drop of 6.1 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature. These experiments offer an exciting look into aerogel's capacity for passive cooling, but even so, it'll be some time before mass production of aerogel coolers is practical. In most cases, aerogel panels can be as much as 10 times more expensive than traditional insulation materials whether they're composed of silica or cellulose. Aside from cost, the majority of testing has only been done at a lab scale. But that's not to say that aerogel is light years away from existing in our homes and workspaces. Its insulating properties are also useful in another essential part of architecture, windows. Poorly insulated windows can be more wasteful than you might think. According to MIT, each winter, windows across the US lose enough energy to power over 50 million homes. I can see that happening with my window. Uh, but I've actually got it changed uh, s recently, so I've uh, seen some improvements. Uh, I'm going to stop here, and I think uh, we get an idea of what the design does. And I also think that I probably focus on for them. I mean, of course, I'm not the researchers, but I guess they would be trying to focus on a more affordable and scalable way of this passive cooling. 
which but it looks promising it looks really promising and uh i'm, I'm encouraged as far as cooling i'm sure there's the concept is already being used somehow on a smaller scale but uh let me know what you think in the comments and also feel free to send an email if you like and please like and subscribe thank you so much for your time and again thank you so much